Yeah, it was Terry, but it run its course. There's nothing worse than seeing what was once a great club or a great pub or a great anything being dragged out for too long by people and dying in its arse, which is what was happening. It depends what time of the scene you come into, how much you value Henry's. It's a natural, a logical progression for things to, to, to reach a certain point and then begin to, to, to slide again. And I think Hey Henry's was going really stagnant. I think you had certain people that became involved in the organisation of Henry's that were just not good for the place. Do you know, it didn't become about the club anymore. It didn't become about what Greg and Shane were doing. It didn't become about, uh, about what Steve was doing in the back bar. It didn't become about the vibes in there. People went in there because they were more interested in going down to the after party afterwards. The club was almost secondary to it. Going to work, you don't say it. Well, I I know there was a. You just did not say it at work if you went to Henry's, uh, because you'd get a slagging. Do you know you actually would? You'd get a slagging for it. I mean, there was one lad that I worked with, and he used he used to dress like a raver at work, and uh, I mean they used to ask him, "Do you go to Sir Henry's?" And he wouldn't tell them. I knew he did. He knew I did, but we would we wouldn't talk about it at work because. We knew people's mind at that time. People were narrow-minded to it. I think, Do you know, if the older generations were, obviously, they, they, it was something that they didn't understand. So people, when people don't understand something, it's easier just to push it to the side and go. Do you know? event associated place. Nighttime or I would get a bit of a crowd in, but it was it was dying then. It was like it was the eighties, you know, I mean Jesus you know, people, you know, grew up in the Celtic Tiger, you know, like seriously it's, it's no joke. There was a lot of a lot of depression out there. There was no money. There was you know, lots of things weren't happening like and that permeated into the social scene as well. You know, for an underground bar to thrive, there has to be underground stuff going on. I think it was just in a state of flux at the time. Just nothing happening. An awful lot of people were taking the boat to London. Do you know? I mean, it was very much a scenario of if if 
if, if, if a group of friends went out every week, say, you know, when your your circle of friends are larger when you're younger, do you know, you might have a kind of a circle of about 20 people who would be your friends and acquaintances that you'd meet up with in the Phoenix or somewhere like that. Nearly every week or two, there was one less, do you know, because people just, you know, there was just nothing there for people and there was just a constant stream of people on the boat over to London and it, it was 99% London because that was very much perceived to be where it was at. Well, I think, I think when it started off, nobody was unhappy about it. Even people who now say, oh, we were kind of unhappy about it starting up. But I don't think people took on the relevance of it starting at the start because it took a while, maybe about after about a year when it really started really taking off and it's in a sense of like that it was almost a religion for people to go over to Sir Henry's on a Thursday night to go to sweat dance and mm -hmm. then we decided to put it on on a Saturday night as well you know which was a big step because still still in all like it was only its development you know as, as, a, as a club night. I remember my sister and all her friends going to the club with a rucksack I'd say why are you going to the club with a rucksack because you had to had to had to had to have a change of clothes with you because that's why it was called sweat, because the place was a sweat box. You could br they bring in a towel, change of knickers, change of bra, maybe two chains of clothes and a change of runners. That's just for one night. Tapes in the early 90s of this music was like gold dust. Do you know, you always had certain people who had a great tape collection, you'd go to them to tape it. Most people wouldn't give you tapes. They'd give, you'd have to give them a blank one, they'd record it for you. They wouldn't let the, that tape out of their sight. Do you know, that's how important it was. I always remember turning around to one guy and saying, how are you getting on? And he just looked up and he was sitting down and he just looked up at me and he went, it's better than sex, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Sir Henry's had an awful habit of being the place that would be identified with those, the, the darker side of it more easily. Right. Because we were doing things that were innovative. Because we were doing things that are new. Whether they're indie nights or house nights or, or gig nights or whatever, or putting on a play or anything like that, or the, the kind of new things. And a bit of the baggage that came with the whole thing was the ecstasy culture. Any musical movement that makes a difference coincides with the arrival of a new drug. You could say the same with, 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 psych with, with the psychedelic music scene in the late 60s. This was kind of similar. Ecstasy was a new thing that opened up all kind of new you know, streams of consciousness for people. You know, we, nobody had ever experienced anything like it before. So it was very revolutionary like that. That scared the shit out of people who were not part of the kind of drug culture. An amazing thing was, I think, if you remember, when it first, when you first used to go there, because, you know, the Hacienda at that point was, everyone was on ecstasy. And it hadn't quite hit there. No. Yet, or not flooded there. And uh, everyone was on pe stout. People were on stout, <laughs> and, which was amazing and great because, you know, they seemed to be having the same ecstatic feelings that 
people there did on a pill. You don't need the drug to to enjoy house music. You definitely don't. But it made us, I think that what at the time it made us understand it. The full experience at that time was to take the drug with with the music. Do you know? It was a release. It was something that a lot of young people wanted at that time. We wanted it. We didn't know what it, we, we didn't know what we wanted before we went in there, but we knew that's what we wanted when we got in there. I mean, it's a very dodgy subject talking about ecstasy and house music, but it's not really an issue anymore. I think for I mean, back then, in the, in back the, then it was, it was a like hot it was, issue. Yeah, yeah. it was a very hot issue. Yeah, you know, it was sort of the now it seems like God. It's, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, does anybody care it's about that kind of thing anymore? So, yeah. It happened and people did it, so what could you do? At the time, it sometimes you would, you would have got annoyed, you know, that it, would, it always seemed to be like uh, about things like that rather than about yeah, what, what, the, the what you were doing, things. things. But yeah, it was always yeah. like the obvious, the obvious way in was that, was, was through that, like, so it was kind of <laughs> annoying. And the media always loved those kind of things, scare stories yeah. and that, you know, and the youth and, yeah. you know, young people out of their minds. The Hacienda was huge at the time. I mean, it, it all started really with, with the likes of the Hacienda, like in 87. The, the whole dance thing was, was fueled by them and a couple of clubs in London and all these underground clubs all over England. So to get somebody from the Hacienda over was, was a real guest thing, like, and, and just people went mad for it. There was nothing like it. When the Hacienda opened in, well, I mean, a few years before I started, but what, what year did it open? Uh, 82. Yeah. I nearly got it 10 years out then. Yeah, it was just a venue that uh, put on things that other clubs really wouldn't touch. You know, it wasn't really a, a club venue; it was more of a, a concert venue, wasn't it? And it? Well, no, it was both. But it was it was um, it was it was the the leader. It was the first place that sounds weird now, but it was the first place where the DJs didn't have a microphone. Yeah, it was the first place that had a weird design, like no clubs were designed like that. It was the first place that the the door policy was that there was no door policy. If you behaved yourself when you got inside, that was great. Because up till then, you know, you used to have thugs in ties, didn't you? Clubs that yeah, would yeah. let you in if you put a shirt in town, but they were usually the biggest thugs in town. Mm. And like, you know, alternative people, or whatever you want to call it, never got into places. There was nowhere else in the country you could go to hear. Yeah. Well, I mean, I was doing something in Nottingham, that's why Mike asked me, but um, there was nowhere else in the country that was playing all this amazing house music that came from, from North America. I kind of went away from the night thinking, well, yeah, this is how you do it. You know, this is, of, you it, know, was, it was very, uh, I, th I think it was very important. Kind of yeah, it was, anyway, and it changed, the, it changed the way you DJed and everything. Because like, he, he did go from like house and he went down into hip hop and built it up from hip, hip hop tracks back into house again and mixed it together, which we really hadn't seen. Yeah, right. You know, and and just the it, I think the idea of programming as opposed to just be mixing the beats together. Well, we never program the set. Well, no, we never program the set. Uh, no. I don't think as a DJ you can because you you're, you're you're the soundtrack for the night and you're watching the crowd and you know you know when they're gonna you know to take them down a bit and you know then all of a sudden let it explode and, and it's the whole thing of peaks and troughs, you know, peaks and troughs, yeah, drama and you know and. Um, we we knew how to do that. You saw with him that it you could actually you could build this thing into it. You know you could use your if you, your intelligence and yeah. you could turn it into a you know people might go away thinking wow mm. never thought of those two records together but they make sense. Right. Yeah. So that was a big turning point really for the the whole idea. And we were then getting the records mail order from Ross in Spinning who was putting his our bags you know were the same as the bags that Graham Park and Mike Pickering were getting. So we were kind of right up to the minute. With yeah. the house, with the house music, so you were getting probably all the best of it at, at, the, at that time. So I, I, I suppose it just followed on from there. We set him up um, through Russ so that he'd send a lot of the stuff we were playing. Oh really? Yeah. I don't know that. And then Russ came out. What did we get out of it then? We didn't. Russ oh, got no. a gig out there. All oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of people from uh, Parafem, where we bought uh, our, our equipment initially, were Henry's uh, disciples, if you like. They used to come down from Dublin uh, specifically to go to Henry's. So it was the place in Ireland that was playing the best house music and had been for years. Weekenders were nuts. Weekenders were, weekenders were absolutely nuts. Um, generally, they used to um, 
They'd have a load of DJs on a Saturday night. They'd have a load of DJs on a Sunday night. You know, I remember they got, um, Jesus, I remember they got one particular weekend where they gave over what, the, the room downstairs, um, the village, I think. Yeah, the village downstairs became the Relief Records room. Relief Records were, um, I think, they're from Relief Records. They were from Chicago. It's a really small label, Relief Stroke Casual, a really small label from Chicago. Now they got much bigger. But at the time, um, I remember Greg saying to me, oh, blah, blah, blah. Relief records, we were going to have a relief records room downstairs, and I was going to go, oh, yeah, 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 relief records. The first one was the best one, just from the style point of view, because of the whole, uh oh, it was just the trepidation of will it work, will it, whatever, you know, but then we worked hard at the first weekend and got it really, really well. Because maybe we got a bit lazy on the other one, it's like, you know. They'd open the entire Higher. kind of building, basically. You so know, you could go in here. There might be five rooms of music. Yeah. Um, ranging from uh, like Chicago, Jack and crazy, you know, tech house. Laurent Garnier or Claude to, Young. Like, you know, some live hip hop in the back bar or, or you know, some beautiful new York I think one night we had, had, did we have Claude Young downstairs and Laurent Garnier in another room and some New York DJ in Boo Williams. Boo Williams or I mean, it was just outrageous lineups. Yeah. So, and I mean, at that time there was no big things going on in the country either. So you got people to travel. That was, that was really the idea. Was to, was to pull all these different people in and see what would happen. And put a load of people on and have a huge party for a weekend. I remember Lauren Garney was playing on the Saturday night. And Carl Cox was playing on the Sunday night. So a big gang of us went, went to Lauren Garney. We were tr absolutely twisted now at the time as well. Um, oh God, yeah. But I remember the um, place was rocking now. It was really, really, really big, really rammed. And, you know, he was playing his kind of hard, kind of techno, funky kind of house, you know, typical Garnier kind of stuff. And about two o'clock in the night was really, you know, it was kind of peak time of the night. He mixed in um, Donna Summer track, I Feel Love. And when it came, I remember, I always remember when it came to the, um, when it came to the chorus, he kind of hit these strobe lights. <laughs> And I swear to God, I actually thought the roof was going to be lifted off the buildings. It was the most, I said it was one of the most exhilarating moments in the club I've ever had. I remember to this day, it was amazing. Absolutely amazing. Now it was, it was probably fueled by things as well, if you know what I mean, but <laughs> <laughs> it was great. It was fantastic. For me, it was the Capricorn 20 Hertz because to, I, so many people talked about that song that night afterwards at parties. I mean, it was just, do you remember this song that, uh, you know, as it was described as some people were saying, it was like a marching band was coming into the room as the, the dance music was on. It was such a bizarre song to hear at the time. Uh, it just suited the moment, that moment and that time. For me, anyway, I think it was a unique song. You know, I had something that other songs didn't have. It just blew people away. The place got more intense and the people started. The roof just started to lift off the place. And it's those moments when you experience them, it's just like, I think they'll never leave you, do you know? It was on the wall inside in Jim Common's shop. I walked in at lunchtime. It was a Thursday. I had no money. I owed my mother about 40 pound as it was. I took a half day from work, which I would have lost out in money anyway. I ran home, begged her for 50 pound, ran back in. Jim had a record on hold for me, gave Jim 50 pound and I was down to 10 pound that week because I got docked the following week from the half day I took off. <laughs>
Edinburgh 20. Like the song meant an awful lot to a lot of people. Like you know, hundreds of people in Cork loved the song and they couldn't get it because it was only on double vinyl. <coughs> and not everyone had a deck. So there was a school of thought that if this was put on CD, that you could make it available to a lot more people at a price. I had a deck and I had a copy of um, Ball and Chain. No, there was a little nick at the start of it, I always remember. So I um, went out to the studio, stuck ball and chain on the CD. Brought a couple of them into the shop, like that, out the door. So I was in the phone straight away, so, so um, I said, look, a box of a hundred of these straight away, so box of a hundred, box of another hundred. Ball and chain, I was all over the place at the time. What happened then, of course, was like, was other people were seeing it. People who wouldn't be used to, um, the ins and outs of the underground record world, and I, uh, that's how I'd put it. We're just thinking, oh, the CD with ball and chain. Oh yeah, I'll go in and buy that in the record shop tomorrow. It must be available. First of all, one of them ended up in the, uh, uh, apparently, allegedly, on the desk of one of the heads of HMV in Ireland. Then, one particular Saturday night, I came home from work, and um, myself and Katrina were in the kitchen making dinner at the time. And I remember this guy, Mickey Mack, he used to do the dance show on 2FM on a Saturday night. He used to do it at 7 until 12 or something like that. I remember I was standing in the kitchen, the radio was on, and the next thing I heard Ball and Chain coming on. The next thing I heard the nick, the kind of tick, tick. I was going, Jesus Christ, that's, a, that's one of ours. So I was starting to panic at this stage, you know, I was saying, it's going to be rope, you know, here. So then... The following Monday or Tuesday, I was at work and I was talking to a friend of mine who was um, working for the company that would have distributed Azuli in Ireland. Very nice guy, you know, lovely guy. And um, he was chatting and he just kind of said to me, he said, oh, ha, ha, ha. He said, we all thought it was really funny what you did with that ball and chain thing. I said, oh, 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 what, 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 oh yeah, that, yeah. Shit, right, get rid of them, that's it, so... That was it, yeah, that, that, that was, um, but we were providing a, a service that wasn't available at the time, you know, and um, <laughs> <laughs> at very little profit. <laughs> and I remember it got, a, it got a re an instant, not, not the first time, but the second time you played it, it got an enormous reaction. And it was like, I, I don't know, because it's not very obvious. You know, it doesn't have an obvious breakdown, or it's not a big as, drum as roll. As far as I'm aware, it's, it's like it, it didn't make anything sure. resembling that sort of impact. I think, I think actually, like Azuli actually pressed it up again on the strength of Cork. Yeah. They ran off another five or 600 copies just to... The label. Because they were just like, why? And they were, they were thought it was the other mixes. Mm. And this is the small little mix on the B-side. Oh. You know, it's one of those real Henry's things. There's like so many anthems here in Cork and it's just so amazing and so incredible and there's no way I could do all of this so we're going to do it all again tomorrow I hope. You coming out tomorrow? That's what I did tomorrow. Come on tomorrow. Oh my god. I have a question. I'm looking right at it. Everyone, come on, just put ball and chain. didn't drink the stout at Henry's. You just didn't do it. You didn't ask people, like if you were a stranger going in there, you know, that's the bit of advice you were given, you were told that. Anything could happen, like, you know, if you wrote that down, if somebody told me that morning that was going to happen, I'd have probably said, I'm staying in bed. I don't want to know about it, go away. But it just happens in front of your eyes and you're just... It wasn't perfect. You wouldn't get dressed up and wear your best clubbing gear going in there. You wouldn't go in there dressed from head to toe in white lycra because you come out dressed from head to toe in black lycra. 
the black stuff on the floor. Yeah, what was that? We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon it was sweat and the, the tiles. Sent to the lab for analysis. And like nobody could figure it out. And once it got on your clothes or shoes, it would, it, yeah. it would never come off. It was very, very strange. I, I don't know. Place really didn't get that much of a cleaning. Um, toilets were definitely ropey. We got a laser done for, for two gigs, Stephen's Night, New Year's Eve. Big old water cool laser. Set it up on the stage and it had a degree arm of going like that and writing stuff on the ceiling. Brilliant, great, great, great. Jerry Lucy comes in. I suppose the man was about 65 you know, at this stage. And he says, wouldn't it be great if we could fire the laser out through the side wall out into what was a courtyard and there was a stage out there with a yellow Cadillac up on top of it. Why? I don't know. And he wanted to put a mirror ball up on top of that and hit the laser off the mirror ball and have it shoot up into the sky. There was these two guys standing there, drinking away. And the, we were watching the drips coming down and dripping into one guy's drink. We were watching it for about 10 minutes and the drips kept going. So the next thing, he was drinking away. So the next thing, his friend kind of nudged him and went, oh, ha ha, look, the water from the ceiling is going into your pint. So we decided this is when we moved. So we went over and said, listen, um, that stuff that's going into your pint is actually piss in your man. First of all, I thought we'd have to get a permit from the airport anyway, so I kind of shot it down at, you know, at half five and the doors were opening at seven o'clock. It was kind of a bit touch and go. Jerry, leave it, forget it. So myself and Greg went away to get something to eat and we came back and... Half an hour to the doors opening, there's Terry Titley with a Kango hammer making a hole in a half a metre thick limestone wall, dust everywhere. And he made the hole in the wrong place. A lot of people from the outside, including the media here, do you know, you know, twits like the echo and people like that, looked at it as being, you know, a lot of scumbags are going in there, they're taking drugs and they're knifing people. That wasn't happening at all, that was rubbish. It's absolute not a crap. I suppose it did have a name, you know, at the time. Um, but that was people's, I think some of it was people's ignorance. And there was truth in it as well. Do you know, it wasn't as bad as I think people made out to be. Because if you went looking for trouble anywhere in Cork, you're going to get it. You know, and if you, if you mind your own business and go into a club, nine times out of ten, you won't have the trouble that people think you would if you walked in those doors. Yeah. The thing was, that I think that scared a few people was, <laughs> It just brought everyone from both sides of the city together. Our crowd came up from all four corners of the earth, like, you know, middle class, upper class, lower class, you know, they all came. And all the badness wasn't to do with one particular group, you know, there were bad eggs everywhere, like, so just trying to weed them out was the, was the biggest hassle. You talk about the trouble that was there. In my experience, the only trouble ever happened outside caused by people who couldn't get in in the first place. You know, I mean, I've spent many a night in there and I've never actually felt threatened inside there. You know, there, wa there wasn't an unsafe, for the most part, there wasn't an unsafe and hostile atmosphere in there. Sure, there was, you know, you'd have isolated incidents, you might have the odd fight and stuff. No more than you'd have anywhere else. But, you know, the attitude very much was that, you know, these kind of, you know, you had a lot of working class people going in there as well, so a lot of snobbery like that, you know, that the, you know that, that these people, you know, they were more likely to cause trouble than some pillock in a suit down in Mangans, you know, which, again, is crap. There was this north side, south side confrontation going on, you know. I mean, when I was very young growing up, there always was, you know, gangs in, in Greenmount, Toker and but you know and other parts of the city but i think that kind of that brought down the barriers definitely a small bit i thought yeah. sir henry's definitely kind of i mean i suppose because of the drug scene at the time you know it was a loved up you know a night and people didn't want to have a fight most of the time people didn't want to argue everyone was happy and everybody was positive there you know wake up in the monday morning go to some shit job what are you going to do look forward to sir henry's if you didn't have sir henry's you'd be miserable that's the way a lot of people looked at it. Yeah. That wasn't me, but that is a lot of that, that is the way eighty percent of the club, I think, in my opinion, was. I think we were targeted. I think we were targeted by members of the Gardaí. Uh, I think we were targeted by members of the media. Um, and we were targeted by criminals. But you know, some would say fair game. That's part of it. You know, I mean the guards are there to do their job. 
as they see fit. They, they mightn't do it as I see fit, you know. And I might think I thought they were quite sloppy in certain instances, you know, but that's my opinion. A lot of the time with the trouble outside, the trouble outside could have been prevented if the cops had actually just moved people on and policed it properly. A lot of the guards, I mean, and I'm talking about the, the top guards in Cork, I think they understood kind of our position, even though they couldn't come out and say so. I think slightly they understood it, in that we were making an effort to try and control it. We were just trying to run a club, you know, but they couldn't publicly come out and say that because they'd be hammered. I know it's a cliche and I know it's something a lot of people say, but the atmosphere in Henry's was unlike the atmosphere anywhere any club I've ever been in in my life. And I would say that it's unlike the atmosphere in any club I ever will be in. I think it had its time. I really do. I think Henry's had its time. Part of me says, you know, Time moves on, generations grow up. You know, we're, the early 90s, a lot of those people now are 15 years older. They've started young families. How, how far can you take it? How far can you take dance music? I mean, like the, the big thing is a lot of people travelled. You know, a lot of people from Waterford and Limerick and from Tipperary or wherever from around the country came to the club. So that made it quite different. Right. You know, so that gave it this different air. So you never, you, you know, you never, you couldn't predict it. You know, you could get a load of people from Waterford up one night and it'd be a crazy night. You know? Or Limerick. I knew gangs from Waterford. You actually knew where they were going to stand when they came in. Great gigs. There's Donovan, there's John Martin, there's Nirvana, Sonic Youth, Big Audio Dynamite, Tom Tom Club. You have to have new people coming in all the time. You have to make it fresh. You have to have new people for younger people that are coming up because younger people are more interested in seeing their friends DJing in pubs and clubs than somebody who might be a little bit older than them that they don't know. It's how we all started. Like, Cork is a very, very small provincial town really and to have such a history in music generally all over the city I'm talking about all genres of music is fascinating really it's fascinating and to be at the hub of something you know when it's happening to be able to look back on that is something special really you know just say I was there for that I saw that happen I saw it grow I saw leaves wither and die on it too Sometimes I feel like throwing my hands up in the